Welcome to the Back to the Garden podcast, the podcast discussing early years. This podcast is inspired by our nursery, Back to the Garden Childcare, a natural child-led nursery in Broadheath and Lynn. Children are the future, so how do we give them the best start? I'm your host, Sadie Pickering, actress and voiceover artist, and also the daughter of two of the founders. On the show, we'll be diving into ways to nurture children in their early years. We'll be meeting with parents, child development experts, and entrepreneurs in the sector. How can we forge a natural approach in this modern world? Join us to find out. We're here with a new series, which is also filmed, so definitely check out our new YouTube channel. We are Stardust, we are Golden, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. Today's guest is Hannah Salito. She's a skin healing expert, blogger, best-selling author, entrepreneur, and mum to Freddie. She's an inspirational lady who overcame her own struggles with her skin by healing herself naturally, which led her to want to share this with others and help as many people as possible, which you can clearly see she's doing over on Instagram with the massive following that she has. She began with a blog which led to her creating her first book, Radiant, which became an Amazon bestseller, which sold 35,000 copies worldwide. And in 2019, she secured investment from Tej Lavani and Peter Jones on Dragon's Den. She then published her second book, Skin Healing Expert, in 2020. And she has amazing product range, which looks at healing the skin from both inside and out and we're really excited at Back to the Garden because her next range is going to be for mum and baby so we're really excited about that and that's inspired by Freddie who I think you can hear already who's going to be part of our chat today. Hannah is open, honest and real. She's a genuine person and completely herself which is part of why she's got a loyal and ever-growing following. So we'll be hearing about her journey, her struggles, her successes, pregnancy, mum life, and so much more. So welcome to the show, Hannah. Thank you so much. I can only apologise for Freddie's interruptions there. (laughs) Oh, we're so happy to have him here as well. Welcome to the show, Freddie. He says thank you. (laughs) So our first question that we ask all our guests, is what's your earliest childhood memory or a pivotal moment for you during your childhood? Do you know, whenever people talk about early childhood memories, and I've thought about it more since having Freddie, I always think back to sitting in Lime Park. I'm sat on the steps in Lime Park eating an orange ice lolly. And I was telling a friend about this and she said, when you're picturing that, are you looking at yourself almost as if you're looking at a at a television or are you sitting on that step looking out at the park and I said I'm looking almost as if it's a television image and she said that's not a memory that's a photograph you've seen and I asked my mum and she said yeah we've got that photograph so it's not my first memory and I've been saying for ages that's my first childhood memory and it turns out it's not. That's so interesting. How old do you think you were? So I think in that picture, I've now since seen the picture, I think I'm probably about five years old. Um, and so then I was thinking, what is my genuine first childhood memory? And the only other thing I could think was being at playgroup in Cheadle Hume, sliding down the slide and hitting my head on the brick wall at the end. So, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So completely and that different one, memories And that one, you feel there. like you were in your... In your body. And there I was in my body because I can remember going down the slide and, yeah, feeling the the pain of hitting my head and everyone rushing around and checking I was okay. So it's really weird, isn't it? But apparently, I don't know how true it is, but my friend swears by it. If you're seeing the image as a photograph or as a television picture, then it's a photograph you've seen and not a genuine memory. That's completely blown my mind because I think I've got... (laughs) what I thought were memories but they're actually pictures then oh no so it's interesting I'm going to have to rethink all my childhood (laughs) memories (laughs) thank you for that and next question is your early years education do you do you remember or do you know like what your early years education was so I remember a few things I remember going to play group um and it was in an old village hall in Cheadle Hume I remember that really clearly going to play school and again I remember I remember infant school and I remember my little friends from infant school um, who I'm still friends with or at least Facebook friends with these days. So it's really interesting kind of seeing how um, they've grown and developed and the careers that they've ended up going into and the people that they've become. But 
Yeah, definitely the play school. And, and I can sort of picture the toys and picture the things that we played with at play school as well. Um, and <laughs> just joining in. And I remember, yeah, going there two or three days a week because both my parents worked. So regularly we'd, yeah, we'd go to play school. And I, I was excited to go. I loved it. I used to, yeah, I used to love going to play group. And we'll come, we'll move into some of your philosophies around parenting. But first, I'd love to go back to pregnancy. I'm 32 weeks pregnant at the moment. So I'd love to hear this for, for my sake, but also for people out there who are pregnant at the moment or thinking about becoming pregnant. How was your pregnancy? And also, we'd love to hear any tips or recommendations that you'd like to share. Now, I have to say, I had a joyous, joyous pregnancy and a really positive birth. So I think it's always nice when I chat to people who are pregnant that I'm coming at it from that that angle. Um, the first three months were tough. I did have morning sickness that lasted all day. I don't know where the word morning has come from because it lasted all day. Yeah. Um, not really to the point where I was actually being sick, but to the point where I felt like I constantly needed to be sick. And that was tough going. Went off all my food. And, you know, prior to that, I was really into my green juices at breakfast. Just couldn't stomach them. I think the only thing that I wanted to eat back then was pancakes, mango and pineapple nothing else um and it was really strange for me because I'm a real kind of food person and and yeah like I say like my green smoothies um and then the second trimester just completely transformed everything all of a sudden I had these bursts of energy I felt really good I got obsessed with eating like green stir fry so I could eat all my veg again um go hiking again it was just such a difference to the first three months um and at that moment i really started loving pregnancy because mm. up until then it had been like okay this is what i've got to go through you know but it I was feels just... like it's never going to end that first trimester feeling and then all of a sudden i had exactly the same i was just i wasn't actually sick but i just used to heave at yeah anything yeah and yeah. the thought I'm, i love green juice as well and then but the thought of green juice at that time no way <laughs> and I think it it's almost like I don't know about you but for me it was almost like if I could be sick I would just feel better yeah. but because that wasn't happening either it really didn't help and people kept saying you know hopefully at week 12 it'll stop and the midwife was sort of saying well you know we usually find at weeks 12 or 14 or 16 it tends to stop and I'm thinking week 16 you know that's going to be four months down the line but actually at week 12 it was like a switch changed mm -hmm. had my first scan with him and he was healthy, you know, from what they could see on the scan. And that was exciting. And then, yeah, the sickness just seemed to disappear almost overnight. Yeah. It went really quickly. So, um, yeah, for anyone who is struggling with those first three months, hopefully it's not forever. And um, to, would, you, would you say to eat what you kind of want to eat at that I stage? I think you have to. I think you have to. Because to be honest, it's about getting anything in, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And anything you can keep down. Um, and I, I was definitely the person that would have said before that, oh, no, you know, keep trying with the green juice. Try with the ginger shots, you know, try. Now I just look back and think just anything to get some nutrients into your body and just to kind of feel like your stomach is settled and you're feeling a little bit better. And also rest. I found resting really helped as well. Yeah, um, really tired. Yeah, because I was just so tired. But again, that seemed to lift week 12 and then second trimester. Oh, we were hiking up mountains, weren't we? It was just a completely different feeling um, and it was lovely. And that is when I really started to think I'm enjoying, enjoying this pregnancy. And how was the third trimester for you? Third trimester was also lovely, but things started slowing down a little bit then. So my appetite was still there, but it was hot. It was really hot. And so the warmth wasn't helping swelling feet and um, just generally feeling like, you know, days that I would have enjoyed outside sunbathing, I just wanted to hide away inside, you know, almost like in an air conditioned cold room just to kind of get some relief from from that feeling. Um, but I was still exercising a lot. So right up until, well, even after my waters broke, I was still hiking um, because for me, wanting to move and wanting to keep my body strong was important. I was also conscious that you know, pregnant at 43 years old. I didn't want to be that old mum. I still wanted to keep keep that strength in my body and be strong for once he was born. Um, so I did, yeah, did a lot of hiking, a lot of walking and a lot of kind of yoga and just generally keeping my body fit, I suppose. Yeah, so how was your labour? Did you have 
your, the birth, did you have like an idea of how you wanted it? So go? actually the was birth, it... the midwife asked me, you know, where will you give birth? And that was the presumption that I would go to a hospital. Um, and I said Stepping Hill because my presumption was the nearest hospital. And then as I gradually started talking to um, different midwives through my pregnancy, I started hearing that the hospital you choose might not be the one you end up at because of COVID. So because of... Um, staff shortages because of um parts of the labor ward being closed and so i asked a very direct question to my obstetrician and said is there a chance that i could turn up at stepping hill in labor and potentially be sent to another hospital and she said we are looking at withinshaw oldham or tameside potentially if there's no staff and i was thinking i don't that doesn't sound comfortable to me you know turning up in a situation that's already very new to me and then potentially being told oh there's no no room at the inn so i had sort of fleetingly thought about home birth but i guess it across my mind that at my age they love to use the term geriatric so at my age and therefore with an increased risk of problems in pregnancy that it just kind of wasn't an option and every time i'd asked the midwives about the opportunity of home birth they had not dissuaded me, but they'd sort of suggested there might be better choices. I think also because where I live is quite rural, so an ambulance wouldn't be able to get to me because we're down a farm track. So there was that consideration as well. And let's play with this one instead. So there were a lot of different considerations that kind of meant it wasn't the first choice. And then a friend of mine who was pregnant at the same time was talking about how excited she was to be planning a home birth. And I thought, I'm going to be really disappointed if I don't do it my way, because I do really want this. And it was when I started changing my language with the midwives and said to them, I would like a home birth rather than should I be looking at a home birth, that they completely came on board, which was really strange. And I had a fantastic obstetrician. We sat down, we, we created a birth plan together because I had concerns that due to my age, I was going to be met with kind of... Um, you know, just criticisms or scepticisms at, at various points. And because we had this birth plan and because she'd signed it off, it made a real difference to my following appointments where I could say, we've written this, we've written it together. Um, and she essentially approves my choice. Um, and it turned out to be the best decision ever. Then my waters broke um, and he didn't arrive within 24 hours, which is another concern usually for the midwives so they were trying to encourage me to go in to be induced which obviously was something I didn't want um an induction sounds like Freddie didn't want that either. Freddie definitely didn't want it <laughs> induction would automatically mean that you would have to go into hospital yeah. for the birth so I agreed to go in for monitoring but it was five days before he eventually arrived after waters had broken which is you know quite a long time for them so I had a lot of panicking midwives but his heartbeat was fine. My stats were fine. And eventually I woke up four o'clock one morning and thought, oh, these feel like these feel like twinges. The period pain cramps that people talk about. By six o'clock, I was like, OK, this is it. And by one o'clock, he was born. So, yeah, it was wonderful. Really wonderful experience. We had the birth pool at home. So you popped out in the water, popped out in the water and um I had my wonderful doula April with me, who was fantastic. Who's been on this show? Oh, yeah, amazing! April and Chris were on it together. Amazing. So, at first, you know, I'd spoken to people about a doula and thought, "Oh no, you know, I don't want, I don't want a stranger watching me give birth." I'm not sure. That... I'm so pleased that I chose the option of having a doula, especially because it was a home birth. I think um, it was really, yeah, it was really important to have somebody there who was advocating for me and looking after me. And my best friend Rachel was with me as well and two midwives. And we were all sat in my little lounge room with the water pool. And it was just wonderful. And then after he was born, we just, you don't remember this because you were tiny, tiny. We just chilled out on the sofa. And the best thing I think about home birth was the fact that I just got to go upstairs to bed. But there was no big drama of leaving the hospital, yeah. no transition between that hospital environment with, you know, nurses and, and doctors around you and having the kind of anxiety of going home and being by myself. It was just a case of we'll go upstairs to bed now. Yeah. So that was really lovely as well. Always on the move. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to watch, Wowie. Mummy? Wowie. And so philosophies around parenting, let's talk about them. So did you have any philosophies early on, like to do with him with 
being a baby but then also are there any concepts that you're excited to explore as he gets older too so I think from being a baby the things that I always really wanted to be able to do was firstly breastfeed yeah. wasn't sure it was going to happen and for so many friends it hasn't yes. been a possibility yeah. so we were very fortunate that he truffled straight onto that nipple and virtually hasn't let go of it since um so I'm really pleased that I've been able to do that not only for him but also you know it's made my life easier <laughs> especially as a working mum it means that everywhere we go he's got his little food source you know and and yes. it's just yeah it's just works so well for us so I know it's not for everyone and I know it doesn't always work for everyone um but I was really pleased that 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 was a possibility trying to let him explore without <laughs> without using the word no too much I was gonna say but I might have to use it now um without constantly stopping him so letting him explore his environment yes. I think sometimes, you know, my parents look at me like, are you really going to let him play with that as he's sort of getting the trowel in the soil and digging around yes. and crawling? But for me, it's really important. We've got veg plots at home and obviously I've spent a lot of the summer growing the vegetables and he has joined me in the garden and he is crawling around in mud and I just want to let him do that and explore his environment. So letting him explore, but in a kind of, you know, with the boundaries of some safety around him, obviously. Um, and as he grows old, my friend Rachel said to me, this boy is not going to have a conventional upbringing. And I don't think he will. You know, I do have some quite different ideas. I would like to travel the world with him in the camper van and let him oh, kind of wow. see see the world. Yeah. Freddie, you've got the most amazing mum. He's going to have he's going to have big adventures. Big adventures. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we're probably going to do things differently. And I think, you know, some of that depends on work and the opportunities that are available to me. But I'm very fortunate that the way I've created the business is with the ability to to sort of run it from anywhere. Yeah. And that kind of comes with it, hopefully, the opportunity to to take him everywhere. I've got some cousins. My family are from Holland. So I've got some cousins who live by the beach and they oh, are wow. desperate for us to move there so that they can teach him how to surf. <gasps> so become a little surfer. So all these different kind of thoughts and Woo. I think, you know, plans will change as he grows and as, as yeah, as my business changes and develops as well. So I, I'm excited to hear about the way you um, balance the work and home life. But first, to just to go back to the vegetable patch, yes. because I've seen on your Instagram how the two of you are growing so many vegetables and then literally harvesting them, getting them out the ground collecting them and then making a meal straight away in the same night so we're big fans of growing our own we grow our own veggies at the nursery and herbs and fruits and the children love that experience of growing and then taking it to the kitchen and then eating so i'd love to hear more about what you're growing together what kind of meals you're making i think seeing that cycle for kids is amazing as well isn't it and hopefully showing them the cycle from very early on gets them to understand that the food doesn't just come from a supermarket shelf you know this yeah. is something that we we can plant and we can do his favorite at the moment there's this little black um not black currant red currant tree that's growing right right at the top of the garden steps and because he's learning to climb the garden steps he gets to the top and he just grabs his hand grabs all the red currants and just shoves them in his mouth mm -hmm. And the other day he was in his little white vest and the Amazon driver said, oh my goodness, your baby's bleeding. I said, he's not bleeding. He's just been at the red currants. <laughs> and he just constantly, constantly shovels those into his mouth. Let's see oh, if you want some food. Hungry. There we go. There we go. So there's the fruit, you know, we can pick the blackberries, which is lovely. And then the veggies that we grow, we've grown tomatoes. I remember when I was tiny, my granddad growing tomatoes and the smell in the greenhouse of the tomatoes was just so, yeah. I don't know, it just reminds me of my granddad's greenhouse, such a lovely scent. So The smell of your own tomatoes. It's so different. So much, yeah, so different to like so supermarket different. smell. So different. And we walk into that greenhouse and of course now he's sort of tottering about pulling himself up on the plant pots, grabbing the tomatoes, you know, they go into his mouth. Yeah. Um, He's not quite worked out the potatoes need cooking yet because they come out of the soil, grabs those, tries to eat them. So, but it is really lovely shelling little peas with him like my mum used to do with me. And yeah, just showing him this is where the food comes from. And then ultimately making his dinner with it, which is Love really that. nice. And that's why we called the nursery Back to the Garden. It's a Joni Mitchell lyric, but it's that's it. It's getting people back to the garden. So for somebody who's, you know, got children wanting to get, back to the garden 
but maybe a bit like daunted by it what would be your tip maybe your the easiest thing to start with so uh, potatoes are such an easy one to grow because you're literally planting little potatoes and a few months later you get five or ten potatoes off that they're so easy um, and I think it's so much fun for children to be able to plant those as well and then dig for them like it's treasure and dig for them and you know he watches as they come out and he's grabbing hold of them and pulling them from the soil and I think it's also really important for the child's microbiome and I've done a lot of reading and research about this because you know with me having suffered from skin conditions for 20 years my paranoia is around his skin and wanting to ensure that he doesn't end up with the allergies with eczema with these problems and there's so much amazing statistical research to show how beneficial digging in the dirt can be and he does occasionally have a habit of putting the soil in his mouth but I just think do you know what he's you know it's building his immune system within reason it's building his immune system and yeah and working on his microbiome and just making sure that that he's healthy so I think there are just so many amazing aspects to having that as part of their little lives and just how brilliant you know to have children learning that that this is this is what we can do this is how we can grow especially as the world kind of gets more chaotic just having that little bit of peace and and yeah it's and grounding it and really grounding I know he's got the ritual with his granddad where they go around and water the garden obsessed with the hose so his granddad does the watering freddie just chases the hose from top to bottom in the garden and he's so excited now when granddad turns up to do the watering freddie's little face just lights up no matter where he is in the garden crawls as fast as he can to the garden gate you know waits waits for it to open and then that's it the game is chase the hose so yeah every part of it has just been wonderful and i think it's one of those sort of idealistic things isn't it oh i'd love to raise my children to you know to grow veg and to but it's so easy we've we've only got a few small raised beds we've built them with railway sleepers it's not anything expensive we get manure from the local farmer and it's just been such a lovely little project to do and one that i hope you know as he gets older he'll get even more involved in every time every year so yeah it's really nice oh it's so lovely to hear now you've mentioned about your skin and your skin is the struggle that you went through that then allowed all of the things that you've created to come from so it was weird weirdly like um it was almost like a would you say a blessing in disguise like because you've been able to help so many th- people Definitely. through the struggles that you've been through so can we talk about your skin and of course what and I... that was like for you and how how you ended up healing yourself naturally yeah and I do see it exactly as you say <clears throat> it is one of those that You know, you go through an experience like that and you think, why me? Why have I had to suffer this for 20 years? But if I've had to suffer it for all that time just so that one person doesn't have to, I think that is in itself incredible. And, you know, those struggles led me to not only transform my lifestyle and diet, but also my thinking about so many things, my kind of... um, Yeah, you know, what's important? Stress played a huge part in it and realising that actually you know, living a stress-free life is really crucial as well. And then from there, developing... (laughs) I know. Developing a natural skincare range that, you know, then helps people not to slather those steroid creams in, not to have to turn to the coal tar emollients. And... (laughs) Is this the bit where you join in? Is this the bit where you join in? (laughs) Oh, he's also just learnt to... So he's very proud. He's very proud. (laughs) <laughs> now it's just blowing raspberries yeah I think you know every every part of my journey has has brought me to where I am now and and I just think it's incredible to have kind of when I look back at what I was doing then I was selling furniture and you know living a stressful um poor diet no exercise lifestyle and how how my life has transformed and how I've been able to help other people transform their journeys is just brilliant you know and and I wouldn't change that for anything so yeah those those 20 years struggling um are all worthwhile really long time yeah I guess it just becomes the norm after a while which is sad isn't it but it was only through the worst flare-ups where I really used to struggle and besides that it was just a case of that's life you know I kind of got used to it and it's like the skin is the skin like a messenger for what's going it's like definitely definitely and doctors are treating these conditions as skin problems but they're not they're gut problems the symptoms of which are showing on the surface of the skin and i think we've 
we're just treating it the wrong way. We're constantly trying to suppress the symptoms. There's, there's the sound. There's the sound. <laughs> There's the sound. But the symptoms are trying to tell us something. Yes. So actually, instead of ignoring them, instead of trying to cover them up, instead of trying to pretend it's not real, instead of, you know, they, they literally treat these conditions with immunosuppressants. They suppress the immune system. It seems so wrong when you think about it logically. So instead of trying to suppress and mask and hide, let's find out why the problems are happening in the first place. And usually that comes down to gut health in one way or another. And so treating the gut, getting the microbiome back up to scratch and you know focusing on internal well-being then reflects in healthy skin it's so logical and it all stands to reason when you sit down and think about it but for, for 20 years i was under the same illusion that this was something i needed to mask and suppress and and get rid of that way and it just didn't work so and you've been a change maker in that in that world so people have other options now I hope so that knowledge. I hope so I would just like to get to the stage where they consider those other options as a first port of call because quite often yeah. they come to me after trying all the medication after you know steroids have, have created problems with skin thinning after they've suffered with the awful side effects of immunosuppressive drugs it would be really lovely if doctors could encourage people to look at lifestyle more as the first port of call i did hear something on the radio this week that they're actually going to start prescribing exercise for certain conditions and i was thinking it would be really lovely if we get to the stage where doctors say you know the first thing it would be useful to try is a healthier lifestyle mm -hmm. and i know people don't always want to hear it even now people come to me wanting the quick fix and you explain you know that it requires dietary change it requires as a, a real focus on gut health but what cream can I use you know yeah. it's still that kind of old-fashioned attitude of but I just want to put something on it to make it go away I had a similar journey with polycystic ovaries and acne and it went through it wasn't obviously as long as what you went through but it was it was bad and you know I was on and off the pill and antibiotics those really strong ones that they put you on and in the end it was you know it was just committing to healthier lifestyle and it healed itself naturally. My body came back into balance and I think it's, and I always believed that, that I was meant to go through that to help me tune more in more to myself, my physical body, my emotions, my... Um, yeah and it's difficult sometimes talking to people about those spiritual elements and the emotional side and often that is the last missing jigsaw piece for someone so they'll say but I'm doing your diet and I'm exercising and you know it's not healing and I can hear the panic and the stress and the anxiety in the voice and I say you know you don't have to go into detail but could there be underlying emotional issues that you might need to address and it's the part that often we don't want to visit and we don't want to kind of acknowledge and we don't want to delve into but it can often be the really powerful healing part as well yes. so when we talk about holistic i do explain to people it's the whole looking at the body as a whole instead of it being the skin is one thing the brain is one thing the gut is one thing you know it's all connected and ensuring it all functions well is the key for sure minerva place independent retirement living just moments from Lim village center a collection of 45 beautifully designed luxury apartments with the addition of a flexible domestic support package tailored to suit your needs. Prices start from just £210,000. Our show apartment opens in October. Minerva Place Lim. Start your journey at villafont.com. What's your uh, writing process like? Because it started with a blog, didn't it? You started with a blog and then you went into... Uh writing your first book radiant that's so long ago now you know i look back radiant gosh i think is like six years old now it's so long since i wrote that book and um it is because we did the launch we did we did it just feels like was it about six years it just yeah. feels like so long ago um writing process it's interesting i would never have considered myself an author or a writer i was a girl with a story and i wanted to get the story out there and with that came the recipes that I hoped would really help people. Um, and again, I was never a chef, but all of a sudden being able to create these amazing recipes really inspired people. And I could see the the work it did in, you know, not just um, explaining to someone the kind of dietary process, but also encouraging them to go on the journey because it wasn't 
although the diet was restrictive in some ways, it didn't have to feel deprivating. It was like you can actually eat a lot of really exciting plant yes. food. So getting that across was really important to me. Writing, I never sat down and wrote the book from start to finish. I kind of wrote bits that came to mind and chapters that I thought would be interesting. And I remember printing off a first copy of the book. So I sent it to a printer's and got it printed off on A4 and kind of bound with that kind of, you know, rudimentary spiral bound. But it was good to see it in the physical form, like this is what a book is going to look like. And it was a big A4 block that I've still got. And um, after I'd written the book, I then realised that I needed to find an agent to get it published. And when I found my agent, she then went through that big block book with a red pen like a teacher would, you know, change this, alter this, let's move this here. And that's kind of how we worked. I work better when I can see things physically like that on paper. And yeah, then the second draft was much better. And that's what we went to the publishers with. And then obviously the publishers do a lot of the work in terms of professional layout, professional photography and seeing it all come together. It still feels crazy that I've got a book. You know, sometimes I look and think, wow, well, well, two. Yeah, (laughs) two books. Um, And that still feels quite surreal especially when I go into Waterstones and see it or you know it's crazy crazy. and Skin Healing Expert came out in 2020 is that right yeah so Skin Healing Expert ended up coming out during Covid so that was supposed to be published at the start of that year but obviously the world went crazy and we then published later that year and it was a much more subdued launch because restaurants were still closed we couldn't have you know the lovely cafe opening that we had at the yard and just none of that was available really for the second launch So it was much more kind of under the radar, but the book has been just as popular, I think, because it's almost easier for people to follow it. With Radiant, I went from my mindset, which is very all or nothing. If I'm going to do something, I'm all in. So 28 days juicing and eating clean was was just my mindset. Whereas some people said, you know, I'm a day into juicing. I can't do this anymore. And then they'd come to me and say, I failed. I tried your plan and I failed. And I thought in that situation when you're already dealing with a chronic skin condition that's making you feel um, quite depressed at times as it is the last thing you want to feel like is a failure Mm. so the reason for writing skin healing expert was to give people a more kind of mini goal focused step-by-step approach where it's not 28 days living on juice and fruit and veg it's incorporate some juices into your everyday diet and if you still want to eat the junk food in the evening for now just Just do that. You know, let's take it step by step. And actually, I talk in there about changing from this cycle of ill health to a a cycle of of well-being. And it is changing those things step by step. So poor sleep, um, medication, lack of exercise, poor diet. And gradually, as you eat better, your sleep improves. And so you feel like you want to exercise and you might want to reduce the medication you're on. And kind of gradually changing the circle can really help. So for some people, that works better rather than go... I'm going to change my whole lifestyle today and then on day one feel like they've failed. Because that's something that you really do. You listen, you know, you ask your followers. You you have a relationship with them. So it sounds like with that, you've really listened to them and adapted and created something else for them to help. Definitely. So because you're constantly we, wanting to help people in the best way that you can. Yeah, because I think, you know, there's writing a book for the sake of writing a book and people were saying for ages, oh, when are you going to write a second book? And I said, I've got nothing to write about. I've put everything in the first book. So it's not that the information in the second book is particularly any different because my philosophy remains the same. It's the way in which it's presented and explained. And that makes a huge difference because that could be the difference between somebody feeling like this is a plan they can embark on and somebody feeling just completely overwhelmed and thinking I can't do this right from the start your regime so that's what inspired the books so that you've created these books people have got those and then the next phase was it was it creating the product range because then you're creating a range that goes with the regime that you were following rather than recommending other people's products that you might not be able to trust as much for your people, your loyal following that are doing everything that you say and trying to heal themselves, creating your own product range that's fully yours, you know what's in it, you know how good it is. That seems like an obvious next step. And how, yeah, how did it happen? Yeah, so that that's exactly it. It was what would I trust on my own skin? And I began working with a local aromatherapist and she created a little, helped me create a little kitchen table range of shampoo, body cream um, and a balm and that's what I began using on my own skin and when people asked me what should I use I thought oh Lisa's products will be perfect you know so um, 
we then developed the little logo and we started selling them and I remember asking her at one stage could she make me 20 shampoos because we'd had a, a busy month that month and she felt I think completely overwhelmed at you know at the levels that I was asking for and I'm thinking I don't want this to be available to just 20 people a month I'm thinking 200 2000 I want to help as many people as possible so actually it became clear quite early on that we were going to struggle with the quantities that I would need and I then started looking towards larger manufacturers but also didn't want it to become just another white label you know stick your name on it range I wanted someone who would really work with me to create the effective products that you know that that we'd managed to develop through aromatherapy and I found a wonderful skincare company down in the south of England and they were the guys I really wanted to work with and I emailed them I emailed a few but they were the ones that I really kind of thought god I hope they get back to me you know I hope they're the ones and they sent me an autoresponder back just saying we're too busy we're working with too many clients and unfortunately you know we don't have room for any more and I felt quite indignant and I replied and I said have you seen my story and linked my story which at the time had been featured in the Daily Mail and immediately they messaged back and said we want to work with you we want to chat to you this this is amazing and I think for them because they're natural and organic and all the things that I wanted them to be, they realised that there was this amazing opportunity to work on... Oh, rice cake go down the wrong way. Sorry about that. Um, this opportunity to work on a product that would not only... That wasn't only a lovely cosmetic range, but that actually had the opportunity to really benefit people. And the exciting bit was sitting down with them and all of a sudden, not only did I now have aromatherapist, but it was a team of scientists. And I could say to them, what I really wanted when my skin was bad was a soothing spray that I could apply and the itch would stop. And they would say, we have this wonderful Swiss botanical that in in, um, studies has been proven to work better than steroid creams. Wow. And... So I'd say, well, can we can we formulate, you know, is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. And, you know, things like scar minimizing oil. I was always so conscious of of my acne scars on my cheeks. Is there anything that is genuinely effective, you know, or is it all a waste of time? No, we could use rosehip and avocado and we could create this wonderful um, blend that, you know, has been scientifically proven to help with healthy cell regeneration. Yes, let's do it. So it was bringing science and nature together in the true sense of you know creating an effective product that actually can offer the same if not better results than all the rubbish the doctors are prescribing yeah. you know and even some some rubbish out there in general like rubbish skincare products that that claim to be organic that, that yeah. you know or, or have the, all these claims but they're actually if you look at the ingredients whereas you've created something that is the whole the whole of it is good for you and and then there's the internal product. So you're looking at the skin inside and out, how to heal. Um, so you created the probiotics and things with them as well. So the probiotics came about because I am still very much focused on the internal healing side of things. So of course, the topicals can help soothe, the topicals can help alleviate redness. They can do all these amazing things, but they're still not targeting the gut. So I had in the range um, a skin purity tea and a milk thistle tincture that can do a lot of the internal work. But I knew how important probiotics were to the healing process. And again, with the probiotics company, I must have reached out to them three or four times. And we laugh now when we sit down at meetings. And again, they turned me down and they said, you know, we've got our own products and we're not looking to manufacture for anybody else. But I wanted them. They're the best in the business. They work from a little family farm. I didn't want to go to a faceless, you know, a faceless um, factory somewhere. And COVID hit. And I think they slightly panicked at um, what was going to happen in the market. Because at the time they were in conversation with Holland and Barrett about some of their own products. And so me approaching them, Again, I think it was third time lucky. And I think at that point, the email just landed on the right day at the right time. And I went down to see them and they said, yeah, we're excited for this. Because I said, you know, this has the ability to genuinely change people's lives. And now every now and again, I will. um, They follow my Instagram anyway, but I will purposely email the whole team with a picture and say, look, like a customer sent us this review today. 
and oh. they all send back such oh. excited, you know, excited uh, responses. And it's not because they didn't know their product was going to be that effective. They knew they were they already knew how brilliant their products were. But I think to see it is so different to having somebody explain that it's changed a feeling. So the products that they had already worked on were to improve gut health, to help with IBS, to help with digestive health. And a customer can come to you and say, oh, you know, it's just so good. My tummy doesn't hurt. I don't have bloating anymore. But for a customer to go, my skin looked like I had third degree burns and now you would never know is incredible. And so the visual is so powerful. Um, That product has fast become our bestseller and we just sell thousands of bottles a month now because it's so effective um and that's so exciting to have a product like that you do a subscription service don't you so people don't even have to think yeah it just arrives when they need it yeah because one bottle is a month's supply and i think it's one of those things that um that you know if you've got it on subscription you don't have to worry and we speak a lot to our fulfillment partners because you know I used to cart the orders myself down to the post office but as we've grown bigger we've now got a fulfillment warehouse that does that for us and I say to them the one thing you can never be late shipping out is people's probiotics because they take it like a medicine you know and if they haven't got their supply it's absolutely vital and we do have customers messages you know if um if there are planned royal mail strikes or if there are any problems with delivery they panic because they they absolutely swear by the product we've had customers go on holiday and not take the product for a week and say I will never be without it I'll always take it with me now because the difference in that short space of time is amazing and um and it's just so lovely to be able to sell a product that is genuinely effective like that's it that's it genuinely and interestingly how how you receive no's in the beginning it just shows the determination that you have and the passion genuine belief and it's the purpose behind what you're wanting to do is so strong to help other people you weren't going to take a no for an answer so I love that as well and I'm also very determined as you can see somebody has inherited that trait um (laughs) you are I I watch the determination in his face sometimes you know when he's just determined to do something determined to climb the stairs or determined to get to something and I think wow I've created a little monster here because then yeah I won't give up on things I'm just constantly like striving if I want to work with somebody I'll strive to work with the best I don't want to kind of go to second best and um, and I see it in him now. <laughs> He's going to be one determined little child. So let's talk about that that determination and you taking the leap to go on to Dragon's Den and what that was like for you. You had a bidding war of all five dragons, but you looked so calm and collected. You completely held your own with them. And then you received investment from Tej and Peter. And I just would love to hear what that experience was like for you and yeah, and how it's been since, how your brand has grown and developed. I know you've got some new products coming out um, with the main range, but we've also got the exciting mum and baby range. Um, And yeah, what that was like for you, but also Peter wasn't keen on the name, being your name, was he? But obviously it's still there. So how how did you win him round with that? Tell us all about Dragon's Den. So Dragon's Den, I applied for Dragon's Den in 2018. And at the time I had my little kitchen table range and I was invited down to the studios in Manchester and they asked me to pitch in front of the producers. And the producers afterwards said, that was just brilliant. You know, you're going to get on, you're going to get on. And then they rang me in April of that year and said, we're really sorry, you you haven't got on this year. And I was gutted. And my dad was even more gutted. And he was stomping around the house. I've seen some of the rubbish that gets on that show. You know, (laughs) how could they not let you on? And I said, you know what? It's okay. The timing wasn't right. It's okay. And the following year, I got an email from Dragon's Den. Would you like to re-audition? And... I was like, okay, this is the year. And by then, obviously, we'd work with a science team. So we'd kind of developed the range. And they said, you know, we've been watching your progress on Instagram as well. So that was really interesting that they'd carried on following what I was doing. Um, And they said, we'd like you to to come and pitch again. And of course, that time I did get through. And I sat there at the studio, six o'clock that morning. I remember just sitting in the car and the rain's coming down on the windshield. And I thought... I have an opportunity now to turn the car around and go home and nobody ever has to know that I got the invite for Dragon's Den. I was so nervous about walking into that studio because I thought if they rip me to shreds and make a mockery of all of this, that's everything I've worked for gone. And there was a very real chance that they could have turned around and said, but you're not a doctor, you're not a dermatologist, you're not a nutritionist, where are your qualifications? You know, there was that real chance. 
no, no, go in, go and do it. You know, you've come this far. So in I went and um, I was called first, which could be good or could be bad, couldn't it? You're like, do I want to get it over and done with? Or do I just need another hour to sit here and be calm and kind of get myself together? Anyway, in I went and stood there and the lift doors opened and it's surreal. You know, we were talking earlier about um, first memories of childhood and, and seeing yourself in a photograph. And I sort of picture that as an out of body experience. You know, me stood in front of those dragons. It was just bizarre. And Deborah Meaden was centre, front and centre in a bright red power suit. And I was sort of, it's Deborah Meaden, Deborah Meaden, Deborah Meaden, you know, no part of me relaxed. Um, and I can hear the quivers in my voice when I watch it back. So people always say, oh, you look so polished. and so." But I can hear the nervousness, you know, the nerves were definitely there. I think the bit that people don't realise is you see 10 minutes on the TV, <coughs> but actually the pitch went on for two hours altogether. Really? So, of course, through some of it, you do end up relaxing because it starts to become more of a conversation. Um, so, yeah, gradually, gradually the nerves... <sighs> disappeared a little bit and obviously once I had the first offer so Deborah was the first to offer I thought that's it I can go home and I can say I had an offer from the dragons if nothing else um but what we hadn't prepared for and I'd sat down and I'd auditioned in front of friends and I'd auditioned with my accountant and he'd asked me the figures numerous times so that I knew the answers but what we hadn't practiced for was all five dragons offering I just had you know it was beyond my wildest dreams on that one and then they asked me if I wanted to go and talk to the wall. And whenever I've seen people do that, it makes sense if two people have pitched a product together because they can go and have a little chat in the corner. But I've always thought it looks so stupid when one person goes and talks. <laughs> anyway, they offered me the chance. And I was straight to that wall because just to kind of get a break from the lights, from the cameras, from the, you just want that little space to kind of get your head together. Um, and then, yeah, I chose Peter and Tej. And Peter did question the name, but he acknowledged afterwards he was just doing it to test me. He said, I think it's a great idea that the product comes with your name. You are the centre of the brand. So they're sneaky. You know, they throw those questions in to challenge you. They know what they're doing. And um, and it's because been an amazing Because you are your experience. brand, and aren't, aren't you? And it's every, that's what they invested in, you Exactly. And all the things that you do. Exactly. And for a while, you know, the title of my first book was Radiant. So we toyed with the idea of the skincare being called Radiant and... But ultimately, when people talk about my products, I know that they sort of say to me, oh, the shampoo Hannah recommends, Hannah's shampoo, Hannah's body cream. So I thought it, it makes sense for the products to have my name on them, you know. Um, it's that trustworthy thing. It's you and that's that's it. I hope so. And I think, you know, leading on to the, the, the baby range that we've got planned for next year, I think it is it is that thing of... I can legitimately now put out a baby range that people will have faith in that they know is going to be safe for their little ones yeah. and for their little one's skin because I've proven myself with what we've done so far. Um, and this is why I'm just so proud to have all the scientists and all the people that work with us that create these amazing products because they've helped me achieve, you know, where we're up to today. It might be my ideas, but they've made them come to life and it's just brilliant. It's a collaboration, like you say, rather than the white label thing. It is a partnership between yes. them all. And also Freddie's involved in this one, <laughs> isn't he? He's like a key element to the mum and baby range. Freddie is massively, massively involved in this. I think one of the first products I wanted for him was a massage oil so I went to baby massage um and I was talking to April at the time and I was saying oh you know what massage oil do you recommend and a lot of the time people just use almond oil which is lovely or coconut oil but I thought wouldn't it be really nice to have an oil that is not only nice to massage into your baby but that actually offers some benefits as well so that was kind of the first product that I thought wouldn't it be great if we could put something together and then I started talking to the science team about incorporating prebiotics for skin into products because prebiotics are really important as well and um, and we recommend probiotics for a lot of little ones so we had this kind of combination of prebiotics and probiotics going on and again just sitting down with scientists being able to say i want a lotion i want it to be fragrance free i want it to be good for my baby's skin i don't want my baby to develop a tolerance to the lotion you know all these different elements. Yep, we can do that. Yep, we can do that. And then for them to come up with samples. So ever since Freddie was tiny, I've been using those on his skin. And I just can't wait to to be able to yeah release them as formulas. And not just the products. You know, we've been working really hard on the packaging this time as well, because I think sustainability is, is obviously vital to people. And so my first thoughts were, let's bottle in glass. But of course, once you have a baby, you realise that bottling in glass is not necessarily the best choice. You've got bottles stood in the nursery. He's constantly kicking and knocking things around. So looking at plastics, you know, we decided that 
we were going to develop this range into bottles that were He's also <laughs> obsessed with feeding me. I know, that's lovely. Thank that you. Mummy's hungry. <laughs> Thank you. He's eating his rice cakes and shoving them at me. Thank you. That's so nice. <laughs> I'm going to have to take a you bite to just to keep some. him happy. Yeah, it'd be rude not to. Oh, there we go. Now you have a bite. So, yeah, the packaging. We were looking at bottles that are not just recyclable, but also made out of 100% recycled plastic. Okay. So just all these little elements. Um, and also, obviously, pricing is really important because, you know, being a new mum, you've got so many things to pay for already. So I think we're going to work really hard on all, the, all these different aspects to create a range that is affordable, but that's also highly effective and products that you can trust to put on your child. Basically. Yes. And we'll hear about the other new products as well later on. I'd love to hear about them too. So that's a, such an inspirational story. And um, what, yeah, are you in contact with them a lot? Tej like? especially, Tej a lot. Um, and you're in Holland and Barrett, aren't you? We're in Holland and Barrett. We're just about to launch into Boots and Unifarm in Ireland, which is huge as well. We're now looking at expansion into America, which is amazing. So we're just going through all the FDA regulation to get the products certified for American use, which... It's a big paperwork process, but we're getting there. And that's just been incredible. And Tej has been very hands-on. So he's sort of led the project um, out of the, the two dragons. And just having someone on the end of the phone where if you need a contact or you need some help with something, you can ring them. Even little things like, you know, we were looking into doing online advertising and you think, well, you could just find an agency to help, but you don't know which agency. And so to be able to ask Tej, if we're looking at doing Facebook ads, can you recommend someone? And him immediately coming back with an answer of these are the guys we use. They're brilliant. Just takes away so much of the, the legwork. And it's just, yeah, so, so useful. So they've opened a lot of doors. They certainly don't do the job for me. I still have to work very hard every day. But the doors that they open, that's the amazing part. And I think people's perception of you as a brand changes when you say, I've got Dragon's Investors on board. You know, all of a sudden you're taken much more seriously, which is yes. brilliant as well. And that, okay, so how hard you work and the success that you've had, how do you find that balance in your life for that, for time for you? And time, you know, how do, I, I can see, you, you know, you take Freddie with you to work, so he's very much a part of your work life. How do you balance that work, family, and also you having a bit of time interested it's, to him? It's difficult. I've got a friend who's a health visitor and she asked me the other day, she said, what about time for you? And I said, well... I have my time all the time, you know, and she's like, no, no, but real time for you. And I hadn't kind of thought of it. My time is with Freddie. And, you know, we, we went on holiday to France last month. And again, work carries on as part of it. And Freddie's a part of it. And I'm enjoying myself as well. So it's difficult to kind of split all these things. I think I'm not going to a traditional nine to five job where I sit there all day aching to be with my baby at the end of the day. He's with me all the time. It's, you know, Every element of life is so much fun. Um, and work work has definitely become more challenging in the last couple of months. As you can see, he's very active, always wanting to be on the go. And where meetings before, I would just pop him down to play on the floor and he'd be quite happy for half an hour. That's more difficult and more challenging. So my latest contraption, which my dad helped me with, was fashioning a an umbrella clamp for the pram into a phone clamp. And I now do meetings. I look like a real ponce. I now do meetings on Zoom with a phone attached to the pram. He's in the pram, so he's happy because he's getting to explore and see nature. And um, and yeah, we make the Zoom call on the phone. and It's just clamped onto the pram and I can concentrate. Headphones in, you know, concentrating on the meeting. I can see him. So I know he's happy and he's looking around and enjoying the park or wherever it is we're walking. So I think finding all these little adaptations is important. My working hours are now also quite nocturnal. So the bits where I really need to concentrate on something. The day to day stuff I can kind of manage even whilst he's up and about and we're interacting. And, you know, I always feel like my attention is kind of torn between two places. But once once he's had his evening routine evening routine and his bedtime <laughs> there we go the drrrrs again Rrr, I know you're so clever you're so clever well, once he's had that evening time I can sit and concentrate on the really important bits <laughs> I guess this is a perfect example as well something that you said to me was that you're a big believer in women how amazing women are and how we're really good multitaskers and you're a perfect example of how 
woman yeah. a woman can have it all and you know you're just making things work for you rather than having that like work life and then like mum your solo time you you adapt you you're changing the rules and just making it work for you and finding that space within being a mum and within being um an entrepreneur so and especially for me asking this question because I have many hats and many different things that I do and I can imagine my life with the baby won't be conventional either and so I'm interested to hear what your advice would be to a working mum. I just think you have to do what feels right for you and what feels right for the baby and I remember one of the first posts that I put up on Instagram ages ago when he was born he was tiny tiny it's only been a month, maybe not even a month old. And at the time, my um, Facebook team were really encouraging me to not just post on Instagram, but to post on Facebook. But I don't always find... I don't always find the community particularly positive on Facebook. And I posted a post where I was chatting to the camera and he was breastfeeding. And I got a comment on there. The only negative comment I've ever had, and it's still stuck with me, from a lady who said, you should be concentrating on breastfeeding your baby and not talking on your social media. And I said, but my social media is my work and yeah. that social media platform, you know, is my business. Um, I'm not just going on chatting to my mates on Facebook. I don't feel like I need to concentrate on breastfeeding. He is breastfeeding, so that is going fine. Thank you for yeah. your input, you know. Also, why do people comment on other people's parenting? Things? I know. And it was just, I suppose it's one of those things. And I, and I kind of said to her, you know, I'm strong enough to take that comment. And it still sat with me, you know, nine months later. But I said, just, just please think before you comment on on other people you know what other Did people are doing that? yeah i said it to her politely and kindly but i said it to her and a lot of people in fairness jumped in and and sort of criticized her for having commented but it is that thing of people might think i'm crazy for taking him to photo shoots people might think i'm crazy for taking him here today and they might you know they might say well would he not be better in nursery would he not be better where he's getting the attention solely focused on him but he seems really happy he's and really happy here and we're yeah. happy we're happy and it's nice for people to see normality <laughs> i think so and it is a bit crazy at times and you know and and having a business meeting whilst he's throwing olives across the restaurant isn't always ideal <laughs> but i think these days work is different people's attitudes to children and working life are different i think covid changed a lot of things you know with people working from home with kids turning up in the zoom calls you know people's yes. attitudes changed i think yeah. people realize that it doesn't have to be this kind of hide yourself away in an office and this is my work life and now i will go to my home life in the other room you know life can can be a mixture of everything yeah. um and i've no doubt that that you've got the right mindset as well to kind of embrace it all and and, and just make it you know all a part of your life um and i think a lot of it is just learning as you go and you'll be guided by your little one as well so yeah He's so lovely. You're cheeky. So when does the mum and baby range come out? So we're thinking spring next year at the moment. It's incredible how much testing goes into products. And obviously that needs to happen. It's expensive as well, I remember you saying that. So expensive. But you've got just you've got the, the sort of stability testing. And then you've got things like products are, are tested at incredibly high temperatures and incredibly low temperatures to account for shipping all over the world, you know, to account for the fact that a product might be left in direct sunlight. And all these different tests are done. And those are really important to get right. And they can't be rushed. So some of those tests are eight weeks and there's yeah. no way of shortening that time period. Um, and obviously all the designs and everything take time as well. But it's the testing process, really. And then, and then although we manufacture in the UK, lead times for ingredients. <laughs> ingredients can take a long time. Some of the packaging through COVID, all the hand sanitizers, the companies bought all the, the spray caps. So it was really difficult to get hold of spray caps from anywhere. And all these different elements can, can add to lead money. times. <laughs> he just loves the arm of that chair. He just love the arm of that chair. Do you want your rice cracker back? There you go. Oh, wowie. Special treat. Special so it takes time. It takes time and patience. It so it'll does. be coming out. So, so spring some... 23, we're hoping. Yeah. 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 And then um, 
you've got some new products in the main range as well coming out soon. Yeah, so they're out in September. We have got um, a gentle exfoliator because again, for people with skin conditions, they often struggle with flaking skin and it's nice to get rid of that, but without the harsh kind of feeling of a a really solid exfoliator. Just shout me if you think it's It's good practice for me, this. (laughs) If you don't mind. No, go for it. We're having a boy. (laughs) They they love to climb. climb. (laughs) We've got a shower oil because again, the shower gels can feel quite stripping when oh, it comes great. to skin yeah. so we're really excited shower, shower so in the same way as you would use a shower gel yeah. you've just got to get used to the fact it doesn't foam or lather like yeah. a shower gel would and yeah. it's a different feeling on your skin but you come out of the shower feeling like your skin is hydrated okay. which is really nice um a blemish gel because i have a lot of people with acne come yes. to me looking for advice and a prebiotic hand cream which is going to be ideal for everyone whose hands have really struggled with the sanitizer use over the last couple of years so yeah we're really adapting to what people need yep absolutely the the hand cream has been asked for for so long and i just wanted to have the right product in the right packaging and i think we've achieved it now so amazing you're showing off your little rolling r's again So, so proud we're into rapid fire now. <laughs> um, so, first question is: If money, time, and logistics were no object, what would you create for children? <laughs> I know what my final questions are. Oh, do you? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if what money, would time, I logistics... create for children? Um, I think it's going to be exactly what we have created, which is just a natural, organic. Yeah, I really think so. You know, there've been no corners cut, and. We're in a fortunate position where the company has grown to such an extent that, you know, money, time and logistics are less of a problem. So, yeah, we've done it, hopefully. <laughs> You've done it. Yeah. And what rights do you think children should innately have? The rights to freedom and independence, I suppose. It's freedom. difficult, isn't it? You know, we have such privileged lives in this country and... You know, it's hard to watch children he's from he's going for the microphone <laughs> from other countries and the lives that they live. Um, yeah, I know that that looks fun. That microphone and all the cables look amazing, don't they? It's Why are these cables more exciting know, than the ones own. that you've brought in? Wow! This cable. So freedom and independence, which Freddie. Has. I think so. As you can see, he's establishing uh, both for himself. Uh, uh. And. Um, so freedom and independence for the right and then finish this sentence (laughs) (laughs) children are amazing (laughs) amazing i think before i had him i i I just had no idea i mean nothing can prepare you but i just i had no idea and you know people always talk about oh the love for children and yeah and and i hadn't had children up until my 40s so i sort of heard the saying so many times but actually yeah the love that you feel yeah. you know the love for him even when he's being a little monkey <laughs> even when he's being a little monkey even when he's Look being a little him. monkey it's amazing he just brings so much joy every day and purpose like everything is now about him so everything I'm doing he is always at the forefront oh, of, yeah. of those plans so we're wrapping it up now so it's been ah. amazing today thank you so much for your time thank you for having us Freddie. both oh my gosh Freddie for stealing the show and entertaining everybody <laughs> <laughs> um is there anything else that you haven't shared that I haven't asked you that you'd like to talk about before we finish I think we've covered so much, so, so much. much. I just, yeah, I'm just so excited for you because I know what you have got to come in in the next in the coming weeks and months, and it's, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so excited for you. And where can people find you? Find your offerings or your the amazing products. Where talk us through everywhere that people yeah can go so to. instagram is always a really good place because that's where i love to post you're very active on instagram. so active there's a lot of freddie posts as well so um yeah freddie's always up to mischief in my stories so my instagram at the moment is my goodness recipes but we're actually working to get it changed to my name i was so, thinking that yeah it's crazy isn't it so we called it my goodness recipes because my first book radiant was supposed to be called my goodness recipes and then the publishers called it radiant because they wanted to and so my goodness recipes 
it just feels a bit outdated now because I don't have as much time to share the recipes that I used to post. So there's a lovely, lovely young girl in her early 20s who um, is very much into horses who posts under my name on Instagram exactly with the spelling. So there's just two of us in the country and she posts under my name, bless her. And she constantly gets asked about skincare. So she always messages me saying, I've had somebody else thinking I'm you. So yeah, so she's having to deal with all of that on Instagram. So we are going to change it to, to my name hopefully this year that's amazing that's one of the, the sort of um the bigger social media plans but yeah instagram will be a good place my website is hannasolito.com all of these if you just google Hannah Salito, you'll and find that's so where they can buy the products buy your books absolutely see what you're up to do you still do yeah. the retreats no so the retreats just by coincidence before covid we'd put them on hold because i was so focused on the skincare range and obviously with everything that happened through COVID, I was I felt quite fortunate that we didn't have retreats in the pipeline because letting people down, you know, not being able to pay the venues, all these different elements would have been so stressful. But I would like to go back to doing workshops and retreats at some stage. And the much bigger long term goal would be to have my own little place somewhere with him where we could really focus on growing our own food incorporating that as part of the retreat um but that won't come for for a few years once the the skincare range is is running itself yeah i guess you can only have so many plates spinning maybe at the same time it's true i think yeah for now it's the mum and baby range and watering all the different things that you're doing and that's a future future seed this is it because otherwise you're diluting yourself too much and because i am so hands-on in every part of the business and so reluctant to let go any parts of the business um it's really important to me to be able to to, to you know dedicate my time 100 percent to everything that we do so the retreats and workshops definitely again in the future because i love doing those um but right now i think you would just cause chaos wouldn't you <laughs> He just caused chaos. I think he'd want to use the juicer. He'll be part of them. (laughs) He will be. He will be at some stage. Oh, thank you so much. Honestly, it's been amazing. I've loved chatting to you. It's been, yeah. Thank you so so much. And thank you for entertaining this one. Oh, he's been so lovely, (laughs) honestly. And we can't wait to meet your little one too. I know. Eight weeks. Eight weeks to go. Eight weeks. And hopefully we'll have some um, lovely children's skincare for him to use next year. 5%, 5%, I think, or is it 4% arrive on their due date? So it's, I say eight weeks, but I actually don't know. It could go either way. He was, way. you were three days early in the end. So, yeah. Three days. Three Aww. days early. <laughs> wow. Yes. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and leave us a review in iTunes or on your podcast app. Follow Back to the Garden Childcare on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's subject. And for everything mentioned in today's episode, you can head to the show notes at backtothegardenchildcare.com forward slash podcast. And if there's someone you know who would love to hear this episode, share it with them today. Send them a link, screenshot the app, or just chat about it. This podcast is recorded at LBS Studios. Until next time, in the words of Joni Mitchell, we are stardust, we are golden, and we've got to get ourselves back to the garden.